So um, I'm gonna do this a little differently. I think I got a lot of code slides and I wasn't sure how well they were gonna show up on here. Um, I did the best that I could, but we can, um, you guys can open up your laptops and go to this URL here if you want. And what that's gonna do is take you to a page that looks like some code that you can actually read. Um, I'll put snippets on the slides as we go. Um, the code on the HTML will be in, in context, so you can kind of uh, cooperate there. Um, but, you know, that's cool and everything, but you know, now we're entering into like this circle of trust, right? Where you're not gonna be like on Twitter or do whatever your own stuff, you're gonna pay attention to me, we're gonna have a lot of fun today. But um, I guess legally here in Sweden, if uh, you do stray from my talk like more than once, you have to vote for me a green card. That's just, I don't make the rules here, so. Um, are any of you from Sweden? You, any actual Swedes here? All right, a couple of couple Swedes, great, so I'm um, good. So, I love Sweden. I <laughs> The standard of the audience, right? So I, I got here on Monday morning, 7 a.m., and uh, Jared and I were on the same flight, and we decided we're just going to go all night, all day, beat the jet lag. And then we did it. We saw, like, everything. Um, you know, the, 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 you guys are great. The food is great. The people are great. I really enjoyed butchering your language. You know, I try to read these signs. You know, I, 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 have no, I have no hope. But um, you guys have been really cool about that, too. So, you know, just everything's great. So... I asked people when I was coming to Sweden, what should I see? And they said, there are two things you really need to do in Stockholm. You need to uh, see the Vasa, and you need to go on the archipelago tour. So uh, I'm gonna do the archipelago tour tomorrow, but um, yesterday I went and saw the Vasa. And that, it looks terrible in here, but this thing is huge. I used the iPhone panorama camera to get the whole thing. And uh, this is a great story for you don't know it. Um, King, uh, what is it, a, uh, Gustavus Adolphus I? Anybody know? No? Two. All right, so he, um, basically his, uh, what was it, uncle or cousin was the king, and then he was Catholic, so he had to go be king of Poland instead because he had that fallback job, which was great for him. But um, Gustavus is like, well, I'm going to have to fight this guy because he's going to want to come back. He used to be king of Sweden. He thought it was a pretty sweet gig, so he's going to come back. i got to build this awesome, huge ship to go fight him because, like, for some reason, like, half my fleet just disappeared. So he builds this huge ship, it's beautiful and ornate, and it's, it's ready to fight. It's got 75 cannons on it, and they all have the same ammunition, which is apparently like a big deal, because back then they just hodgepodge cannons, and that was fine. So he's getting ready to go. He puts it in the water, thing gets like 30 feet, and done, sunk. So I'm talking to the tour guide, I'm like, well, wouldn't it be great if they tested this thing before they put it in the water? And you know what she said? She said they did. They said they had 10 tests that they do on the ballast, and if they all pass, then the thing goes in the water. So they did three tests, they all failed, so they aborted the test cycle because the tests were all failing. And then, okay, we're gonna keep going. So, so that's what happened, I don't, know, I don't know. If we have a test run that fails, we fix the test or fix the product, depending on what the problem is. But they decided they would um, just keep going. So um, I took this picture of the back here, and I don't know if you guys know, but like in America, like one of the things we associate with Sweden is, uh, let's see, this guy here. So, I don't know, we just have this chef back here, and I'm like, is this this guy, is this like a real thing? I don't know, but, you know, we also, we also like these. So, Sweden, if you go to America, you say you're from Sweden, they'll ask you if you like the fish, they'll ask you if you like the chef. Um, Swedish meatballs, Ikea, that's it, that's all we know. But this, this place is a lot better than that, so I'm going to go spread the word when I get home. So, um, this is my wife. She dropped me off at the airport. Um, we're in Phoenix, so you see like all the bright, just lots of bright, everything's like 50 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than here all the time, all year. Um, she fit in right here. She's actually Norwegian descent, so don't hold that against her. Um, and she's dropping me off at the airport in this picture because this thing, this, this train at the airport is running. You see it going, but there's no people on it because for six months, they're running this thing without people on it. Why? Well, because if there were people on it and something went wrong, they would die and it would be terrible. So now we're, at least we're testing things before we put people on it. It's, it's progress. You know, we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, so you've got this like engineering paradigm since like forever where you build a thing and then you test the thing and then you use the thing. And sometimes you test the thing and don't care that the test fails. Sometimes you do. So um, that's great. But this, um, now we sort of hit this uh, software engineering thing. And um, it's great because now we have options. And the option we have, which is like the first time in engineering history, we've been engineering as humans for like thousands of years, and like now, we can actually test the thing before we build the thing. We can say, hey, you know, let's, this, this is what we're going to do to make sure the thing works. Now let's build it and make sure it does that. 
So that's my little introduction, and I'm now gonna sort of go into some uh, administrivia about this, and this is how, to, how we're gonna watch this talk. So I told you to go to this URL, which um, is great, and uh, I, I'm proud of it. <laughs> um, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna see these uh, code um, numbers up at the bottom, up top of the slide. That's the piece of HTML that you sh should be on if you want to. So when you look at that, and um, you see that you're not on that page, advance, I'm gonna try to remind you as we go, but um, I might forget. Um, so when you see that, um, you know, it's gonna look like this. Um, click on this guy to move to the next. That's easy enough, right? You don't have to type in new URLs or anything. Um, you know, hyperlinks, how do they work? And, you know, just to make sure I haven't put the number in enough places so you always sort of know where you are and I don't want you to get lost. So, uh, so that's how to navigate the talk. So, um, you know, why are we here? We're, you know, you've heard my stories, but now let's, uh, let's get to work. So we're here to add a feature to React with React Test um, using test-driven development. That, that seems pretty good. <coughs> now let's talk about React for a second, um, because maybe you don't know what it is. It's um, Basho's open source available, fault tolerant, operationally simple, scalable, so you can REST database. And um, we can talk all day about what React is, and <coughs> we better just move on, otherwise we will. So what is React Test? React Test is Basho's uh, framework for functionally testing uh, distributed systems. Um, most of those happen to be React or React related products. Uh, but it's open source, anybody can use it. You can go to basho, github um, uh, github.com slash basho slash React Test and check it out. There's a link uh, later in the slide deck. Uh, let me get a drink here. So, um, oh, the, um, another cool thing about React Test is uh, I kind of made it. So that's why I'm using it. So uh, React Test does our release validation, um, but its roots are a test-driven development framework, which uh, seems like perfect for this talk. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a feature to React Test, and it, it's, not, it's not a bug, although we'll, we'll actually find some bugs along the way. Um, but let's talk about what that feature is. Um, and that feature is um, Java management extensions for React. Now, um, it sort of went back and forth on like what I should choose as the feature to uh, test for this thing. And so why I chose uh, JMX is that it is pretty isolated a feature. It doesn't cross cut a lot of repositories that we sort of use to build React. Um, it's very straightforward. It doesn't involve us knowing the intricacies, intricacies of React. So we don't have to like worry about cap theorem or like, uh, you know, network partitions. We can just talk about testing. Um, and speaking of talk, just talking about testing, it's closed source. So we can't even talk about the implementation. We don't have to. I can just wave my hand and say, I implemented it, and then we can move on. Uh, but I'll show you implementation as needed. And uh, I worked on the, the JMX extension, so it seemed like a great thing for me to talk about. I actually did it with test-driven development, as uh, we'll see right now. So you might be thinking, probably not because, you know, it's not a very popular feature of React, but hasn't React JMX been around for a while? And uh, the answer is yes, it has. Um, <laughs> What we're doing here is we're retooling it, um, making it more like the other statistical interfaces to React that um, you know, it might have fallen uh, behind in parity, and uh, just making the code base more robust. So that's the feature. It's making J JMX extensions for React more robust and uh, giving sort of parity to um, statistics. So yeah, that's what React JMX is. It's the stats URL exposed. Um, but that's only in theory because there's a lot of missing connections. So let's talk about that. Uh, what's the stats URL? Uh, the stats URL is something when you start a React node, you can see here by going to your node and uh, the stats URL slash stats. It's gonna show you a bunch of stuff which you're probably already looking at on the first code slide if you're looking at that by now. Uh, but I'll show you in a minute. You can get the same information from the React and status command. Um, and really it's just general information and statistics about the node that is uh, running. So what does that look like? Here's code slide one. Um, here's a bunch of information. I tried to make it somewhat legible if, if you don't have a laptop or anything. It goes down like forever. So just, just know that this is a very large number of things. And this uh, stats URL outputs a JSON object. And here's a bunch of information and some of it will be relevant to us as we go. Um, if you go if you click the next button and go to code slide two, you're gonna see this. This is the JMX extension. It does not scroll down. This is where it ends. There is less. Um, these things are all camel case instead of like Erlangy terms. So things look kind of different. And these are them side by side. You really can't see this, but this is the entirety of the stats URL and this is the entirety of JMX. And one is itty bitty. So quick history lesson. 
React JMX predates React Test. Like I said, it's been around for a while. So why does that matter to us? It means we can't go full TDD on it. Um, we just we have a we have a feature that already exists, and we have to start with the test somewhere. So back when we did uh, React 1.3 release, we moved everything to React Test from our previous framework, and what we got was um, this thing where we just have to you know port test one by one, and we had this JMX test, and we kind of decided, well, should we port it? Well, not really, because in theory, what it's supposed to be doing is the same thing as stats. And we already wrote this stat test for the same project. Let's reuse that and just change the parts as needed. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna reuse the stats test. And first thing I'm gonna do is walk you through sort of what the stat test did and then how we changed it. So code slide three is the stats test in its entirety. And we're gonna go through sort of logical chunk by logical chunk here. So the first thing we do here is uh, every React test has a confirm zero function and that runs the test. We have this RT deploy nodes function, which, um, so RT is the helper module that has all sorts of like helper React functions in it. This one is deploying a single node, um, and it returns a list of nodes, in this case it just happens to be a list of one. And then we make the assertion that we wait until nodes are ready, and wait until is this cool React utility, React test utility, which is sort of like, you know, sleeps for a little while, and then goes, check some sort of, uh, you know, function that you pass in to say, you know, test this, if it's, if it's ready, then, you know, exit, otherwise, sleep again. Um, so usually we do stuff like this where we just deploy many nodes and then just build them into a cluster together, but this test is very simple, so we're just gonna use one. So now we wanna get stats. We start up the node, it's fresh, we wanna just see what the stats are like. So what do we do? Well, we pass the node into the get stats function that we just have at the bottom of this test, the helper function for this one test. Um, we do this curl that will uh, create the URL based on this other helper function that gets a URL from a node and then uh, decode, it to JSON, decode the JSON string into a prop list. So now we return this prop list of stats. Everything you saw in the JSON string, now a prop list available to us. Why did you sleep? Why did I use sleep? Um, what's that, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna talk to you about that, actually. I wanna steal your framework there. But um, no, what happened here was, uh, it had something to do with curl. I can't honestly remember. Um, I'm sorry about that. I do have another sleep in there, which I explained very well. We'll get that in, in a minute. But this sleep, I, I don't honestly remember why we did it. Sorry. Um, yeah, we wanted, you know, oh, was that it? We wanted to make sure the stats were there, I guess, part of the startup. But, but that should have been wait until, I can't get distracted here. We got to keep going. Um, I, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Although, do keep asking questions because I don't want to lose anybody along the way. Um, so we have this prop list and it's a list of all those stats up there. So now we have this list and it's bound to stats one, which is great. So the first thing we want to do when we start up a node and we have this stats list to say, hey, um, are some of these stats not zero? If you see this enumeration of stats here, it's like CPU and procs and mem total and all this stuff. These things shouldn't be zero. I mean, they shouldn't be we don't know what they should be because every system is different and we don't know what you're testing on, but we know that you're gonna have some amount of memory. So just sort of a sanity check to make sure the stats are working. Um, and that, what that looks like is this, right? You just take a list of keys, which are the stat, I, the keys, um, keys to the prop list, and do a list comprehension over it and just assert that they're not zero. And now that you've seen that and know how that works, then uh, that function again sort of makes more sense to you if it didn't before. <laughs> So now we need something interesting, like, like actually poke React and then make uh, numbers go up, because that's what we do here. So um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna perform five puts and five gets to increment these stats. And the stats only aggregate in, um, above numbers of five, so we, that's why we have to do five. So what we do here is we create the, um, the React HTTP client here. Then we do this, uh, you know, this, we create this list of five items and then we write five of them. Then we read five of them. So we've done our five, re five reads and our five writes. Now it's time to compare stats. Well, you remember this guy, right? Um, he's still bound, right, to that initial set of stats. So it's cool because now we can get stats again, and what we're going to do is compare them. And we have this verify ink function, which is like the verify nz, only it takes two sets of stats, takes a, a list of tuples and number, uh, tuples of um, keys and values, and basically says, this stat should have incremented by this much, this one should have incremented by that much, and we just keep going. Um, and you'll notice some of these numbers might seem counterintuitive to you, especially if you don't know how a React works, and I can dip into it really quick. The um, React put operation does a get also. So when we did five puts, we did five gets also, and then we did five gets, that means every get stat is gonna be twice the number of put stats. 
And then um, the vNode versions are actually three times as many for both because we store three replicas of your data by default. So these are expected values. We expect that's what the case to be. Um, so that's great. So now um, Verify Inc. sort of looks like the same thing, only it fetches the values out of the prop list and then uh, does a comparison to them. It does some cool output by the, um, along the way, so you can actually see what the test is doing as you run it. So, and you know, this is the same function call again, but now you know what that does. And we're back to verify non-zero. I mean, now that we've actually done some things with uh, React operations, um, we can see that these operations all were supposed to take some amount of time. So, uh, we just make sure that it did take some amount of time. The gets took some time, the puts took some time, the average is all working. Um, but what we're, again, we don't know how fast your system is. We don't know how fast we expect these operations to be in a functional test, but we know we expect them to have taken some amount of time. So we check for that. Um, then here we check for protobuf connections. Um, what we do is we create a protobuf connection and we then call the stats and make sure that's incremented by one. Um, that particular stat doesn't need a five requirement, so great for us. The next one is the best one, and then we're done with the stats test. So this one is we force a read repair to increment the read repair stats. Um, what's a read repair? Well, by the time I talk you through this slide, you'll know. Um, first thing we do here is we create a single object in this new test bucket. Um, when we create that object and put it in the database, like I told you, React by default writes three copies of your data. So now we have three copies of this object in the database. Then we say, hey, for this bucket, store four copies of your data. Okay, great. I'm going to store four copies of your data, but I just know that for the future, I'm not actually going to do anything about it right now. So then we go ask the stats again, hey, what's the re-repair status? And they're like, zero, we've never done a re-repair before. Okay, great. Now I want you to read that one object that we put in before. And it goes, okay, great, here's your object. And I go, thank you very much. And then we call the stats again, because behind the scenes it goes, well, after I gave you the object, it was cool, I found it and everything, but I noticed we only have three. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a fourth copy and put it over there, and then it's gonna be safe and we're gonna have four. And that's a read repair So we check the read repair stats, and they're incremented by one. After this is all done, we return an atom. And the atom is passed because the test passed. Um, you can force a test to fail uh, by returning fail, but um, we don't usually want that. There are some reasons too. So what's different about JMX than the stats test? We have the stats test, it illustrates the stats use case. JMX should do the same thing in theory, that's, that's why we like it. Um, so it's easy, right? We just plug in like, uh, like JMX URL and we just use that instead of, um, instead of curl and we're done. There's no JMX URL, you know? There's, uh, there's no JMX anything not Java. There's, it's just this thing that's out there. At least I didn't find anything. So we needed to um, do something to be able to get that. And what we did was we wrote this little Java utility. You don't have to read it. It's the only Java slide I'm gonna give you, and it's code slide four, and you can see it if you want. But um, basically it just um, sees the beans exposed properties and dumps it out to JSON. And uh, what does that remind you of? Well, it reminds you of the stats URL that dumps JSON. So now I have some JSON object with all my stats from JMX, which is perfect, it's exactly what I need. So if you go to code slide five, you'll see the first version of the JMX verify test. And what we do is we take this stats function that we all know and love from the previous test, and we replace it with this guy. Uh, and so what does that guy do? Well, we have this JMX dump command thing, which creates the command line syntax for calling that JMX tool, and then we actually execute it with the following command. And that looks like this, and it's not so great. I mean, it's all right. This thing, uh, this JMX jar path finds a JMX jar which lives um, in the React JMX project. Um, and this is just some class path of, you know, module uh, library path funkiness to find it. Um, this thing actually creates the command line syntax. It's a Java command, here's the class name. And this thing actually calls it, it does the, um, the JSON output, motion JSON decode and all that. And the timer is sleeping. And <laughs> that's, uh, that's important. Because the JMX thing actually only updates stats every 30 seconds. React stats actually update like continuously, but JMX is like a poll, it pulls from React over J interface. So, um, uh, yeah, I put this in for review and the reviewer was like, why are you stopping for 40 seconds? That makes no sense. So I made him this awesome ASCII timeline and since it was so great, I went and found it in the pull request and brought it back for you guys. Um, so what happens is here's where the stat inducing operation occurs. So now these stats only live in the memory cache for like one minute. So when you do that read repair, that read repair just sits there in one minute and then when one minute's up, it bounces off the end of the queue and it's back to zero read repairs. So we have one minute window to see that this stat got written. JMX updates every 30 seconds, which means it could update right here or it could update right here, anywhere in between. So we know at some point after JMX updates, but before this stat expires here, 
the read repair that we want to see is in the JMX beam. So we go look here. We go sometime longer than 30 seconds, sometime shorter than 60. I chose 40. So how do we run this test? Well, the first thing we have to do is make a DevRel of React. And what a DevRel of React is, is basically like six copies of uh, React on one computer with different ports assigned to it and different um, distributed Erlang node IDs and stuff like that. So we wind up getting a, a way to build a uh, React cluster locally on one machine. So we build that. Then we run this awesome script that copies it into a local Git repo. Why do we do that? So that we can always reset the uh, React cluster back to an initial state um, to you know, make sure the test results are always the same. Um, and this script is actually part of React EE because that's where JMX lives, but there's an open source version of it in the React test repo and the only difference is environment variables pointing to the correct um, path because as React developers of Asho, we want to make sure that we have, we can have two versions like concurrently on the same disk and not worry about overwriting them and oh my gosh, I was testing EE when I should have been testing React. So it's more of a convenience for us. So then we go into the React test directory. We make it and clean it, and we make it, and then we run the test with the syntax. Uh, React test is an E script, always has been, always will be. Maybe not, I don't know, sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is the configuration. Can be blank, which just defaults to default. Crazy, right? Um, then E happens to be the configuration I've chosen, I should be touching this. And then T is the test that I want to run. So um, great, we should run this and it should all work because we're great and we write tests, we never fail, and isn't that wonderful? Um, this test should work. But it doesn't, and that's because we have the lack of parity. And what that test result output looks like is this, and you'll see it on code slide six. Um, most of these test outputs should be like a full stack of the output of the test, but I'm just gonna show these stack traces on the failure. Um, and you can go, these types are gonna live on GitHub repo forever, so don't worry about missing out on them. So this is the stack trace, and my trained React test tie tells me that the real problem is right here, which I can show you better by doing this. Um, it's looking for CPU end procs. And I don't know if you guys remember, but um, the CPU end procs thing was like this camel case mess in Java. And uh, you know, there are no CPU end procs. What you wind up with is these lists of um, Erlang terms that look like this, and Java variables, um, method names that look like this, and they just don't match. And it makes sense why you would do that if you were a Java developer, but we really want these things to look the same. So um, yeah, it was looking for this, it found this. So what are we gonna do? That was on code slide seven, by the way. Next, hit code slide eight, and you're gonna see a version of JMX Verify that has this, um, this function here, this process key thing, which basically compensates for the lack of parity. It's saying, um, you know, if you see the JSON object return CPU end procs with all these capital letters that don't belong there, just transform it to this and we're fine. So we do that, and then we run our test again because we fixed it, and you know what? We did actually fix it. This thing passes. And, you see these output messages from the Verify Inc. and you see that you expected vNode gets to go from zero to 30 and it sure did. So great, we've got a pass, love passes. Time passes. So finally this time passes and somebody wants to add features as um, people tend to do eventually. And the first thing I figured as a uh, recovering Java developer, you know, what's my instinct, right? I'm working on a Java project now, what am I gonna do? Mad Maven. Um, so I did that, and um, you know, it, we used to use make files for this project. It literally like went through the Java source directory and did Java C on start on Java. Um, but it should still work now that we're using Maven because all we did was change the build tool. We didn't actually change any functionality. So we just run the test again because we already have it and we know it works. And it does work. Look, it looks exactly the same. Only the timestamps are different because I didn't run them at the same time because I'm not crazy. Um, so we have this thing now where we have this thing that's building with Maven. And I was about to start working on the actual problem I came to solve, which is this mess of parity. And I heard this nasty rumor that if the Java process died, the React node would die too. Well, that's nasty. So how do we reproduce this if it really happens? Well, we're gonna have to kill some processes. And the thing is, is that um, you know, we could just kill nine like random processes and see what happens, but that seems like counterproductive. So we figured we'd find out what the processes actually look like. And if we can identify them, then we know who to kill. So the great way to do that is just throw an assert fail right after startup in React Test. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna give you this awesome output. You know, here, we find ourselves in a situation where a single test failed. Would you like to leave the cluster up so you can debug it? Yes, I would. If somebody asks you that, you say yes, that's how it works. So now that it's running and everything's up and fine, we say, listen, 
what do these processes look like? Well, you know, I filtered out what everything except the one I was curious about. You know, I found there's a lot of these in there. And so we're gonna just based on that, we're gonna just kill them all. So I wrote this like really elaborate function that uh, does PS grep and kill nines and pulls all this stuff out. And I was really pleased with myself. Um, and so then I added this test supervision thing to the test and you can see that in code slide 13. Wow, we really skipped a bunch. I don't know what happened. It's fine. Um, so this thing is great, right? We just deploy the node, we kill React uh, JMX 10 times. Why did we choose 10? Because we, we did peek at the uh, JMX supervisor and see that you know, it had a restart policy of 10, um, re 10 restarts in 10 seconds triggers the supervisor. So we're gonna test what that does. Um, so we did that, and what happened? The test passed anyway, because it's too slow. I was, I was killing process, it took two seconds to kill the JVM. You know, two times 10 is 20 seconds. I need 10 deaths in 10 seconds, couldn't get it. So what do I do? Well, it's React test, so I cheat. I just opened GMX on port 80, and that thing fails right away because I'm not root. So I did that, and you know, I just this did, I set a config which looks like a subset of the React app config. You can deploy nodes with that argument, and you're going to overlay the config for what you need. Um, sleep for 20 seconds. Why? Because this thing takes um, you know 10 seconds or so to crash completely. So let's wait. If it hasn't crashed in 20 seconds, it's not going to crash. So uh, then it doesn't let admin ping, and either it uh, pangs and it broke, or it does something else and we're happy. Whoa, we did it. Um, we totally got that thing to fail. React JMX crash, able to crash node. So great, we actually have a test case for this, isn't that cool? So now we know what it shouldn't do, which coincidentally happens to be what it does, which is a tragedy. Um, so what should it do? We wanna let the Java process crash. Um, if it does, we wanna do the 10 time retry like we did, the thing is, we want to leave the gen server that's sort of wrapping this port to the Java process up so that if, um, if the thing fails, then what's going to happen is um, 10 minutes later, it'll try again. Maybe it was some port that was already bound and you, know, you as an IT administrator fixed it and JMX will come back up again in 10 minutes and it'll all work suddenly and that'll be great. But we don't want JMX as an add-on to be the thing that broke your React node. So let's build a test that actually tests this functionality and we'll do it before we even write the code. Um, and that's what this looks like. This is code slide 16, and that's really hard to read, but basically what it does up there is it calls React JMX stop um, so that it resets any retry counter that exists. Um, then it loads this cool thing, this React test logger background backend onto the React node remotely. It's gonna say that thing, okay, I'm gonna enable these logs on, React, um, on this React node to live in memory. And then in memory, the things are just gonna like, these, these restart messages that React JMX is generating are gonna start, are gonna be um, you know, kept for posterity. So we do that, we start React JMX again, it's still set to port 80, so it should fail 10 times, and then um, afterwards, we, um, we just regex basically through the uh, log messages and count how many times we see this message, which is JMX server monitor exited with code blank. So we do that, and what's happening? Well, my trained eye sees bad RPC node down. That's really bad because I can't, I can't do anything. If you track this line number down where the error happened, you're gonna see that our RPC call to React JMX stop is where the error was. We couldn't actually, um, and we were stopping wrong. So I dig into React JMX stop, and does anybody see the problem with this line of code? Now the, logger, the error logger line seems fine, but, um, Anyone? In it stop. React JMX stop. To stop the application, React JMX, stop the entire node. Gone. No more testing because the node is gone. Um, I think I may be the first person to ever have called React JMX stop. So that's why I found it. So we changed it to application stop and we run the test again. And now this test output looks a lot better because there are actually assertions being checked and everything like that. And again, things start bouncing out at me and you'll, you know, you'll be able to see the orange too when you do this long enough. But the retry count is off. 10 versus 15, should have been 10, it's 15, that's a problem. So let's look at our logger messages that are actually, this is in the JMX uh, server monitor. And uh, what you're gonna see is um, this logger message. And I said, you know what, this is, this is probably some counter thing. I'm gonna actually output the counter increment. So I just changed the logger message a little bit to have an extra variable in it. And we do it again, and the test fails again, same thing, 10, uh, should have been 10, but it's actually 15. So then I look in the logs, and I see this logger message. Look at that, oh, I'm in the way. Look at all those zeros. 
It's not right. It's wrong. Because I did that programmer thing, that one plus thing. I forgot to increment the counter. So, you know, I go back and I wave my hands and I fix the code and I literally just go back to the gen server and put a plus one and then run the thing again. You know, same output message and look at that. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That is 10 messages. We did it, guys. The thing does not crash React anymore. So that's cool. I still haven't even done what I set out to do, which is to bring parity to JMX. All I did was fix bugs that people have sort of been like telling stories about for years. Um, so let's bring parity. How are we gonna do that? Well, let's review um, our problem. Our problem is that we have these, we're expecting these cool things, we get them in stats. We actually get these things from JMX and uh, we don't want that. So you know, that's the same problem we have there. So you guys remember this code, we added it specifically to the test to compensate for the fact that these things were wrong. So if these things are here to make the test pass when the code is wrong, if we take this out, then when we get back, um, now the test should actually fail because it's not doing what we want it to do, which is before what we did want it to do. Does that make sense? Probably not. Basically, now this test should only pass if the thing was like stats. And great, yes, look, the same error. Remember CPU n procs the error? Well, now it's back, but this time this is what we want because when this test passes in this form, we have parity. So this is, um, you know, this is Erlang user conference, not Java user conference. So I'm just gonna wave my hands about some Java that I did here. Um, but JMX beans are, they're like the poster child for like the ceremony of Java, right? There's, you need a class and an interface for a bean, and you need getters and setters for every attribute you want to expose via JMX, and you need a property for those, and you need the getters and setters to work properly against them, um, and that was really annoying. And then when you open up the code, you see, oh, this is why this parity exists. Uh, the disparity exists because people made these getters to look like Java getters, and they only made them one at a time because it was a manual process. So we decided we'd do it with beta program. We'd use this thing Java Assist to actually um, build the beans at runtime which was great because then nobody ever has to go back and like add a property manually again. We also, while we were there, realized we were using curl, so we just changed the J interface and that was cleaner. Except my pet peeve with J interface, by the way, if anybody does J interface, why does an OTP Erlang string extend OTP Erlang list? Should, right? Strings are lists. All right, fine. So that's me. Um, the thing was crashing and it was designed to let the Java process crash and have the Erlang gen server handle it. So it does, great. Um, we're gonna let it crash and not worry about trapping, you know, catching every exception in Java land. Um, but with this like dynamic recompilation of Java classes also, you run into this thing called perm gen space, which is like class loader, like runtime, blah, 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 Java to goop. Um, so if we let this thing crash every time um, it has a problem with compilation, it'll just restart and um, not worry about that. And that's great because when a new stat is introduced via React stats, like if one just appears that wasn't there before, and the introspection tries to set the stat in JMX and the getter is, the setter isn't there, the whole thing crashes. And that's fine because it crashes, then it restarts, it goes get stats again, this time that stat's there for the first time and it builds the class dynamically to include it. So that's great. So we did that and it worked because um, we're good, I guess, I don't know. No, because uh, it, it took a while, this took days, but this is days of Java that you guys don't care about. Um, so after this, you know, we're sitting there, we're all happy with ourselves for actually having a JMX with parity that actually works. And, um, you know, it occurs to us that this is like an overcomplicated solution. And uh, we've read up on this thing, and what happens is there's this thing called dynamic MB. And it's basically the hash map of JMX beans. You just say, just stick, stick attributes in there and they'll be exposed to JMX, no problem. You don't need to compil 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 compile anything. You don't need to uh, you know, have a bean, you don't need to have an interface, just put them in the hash map and they'll be exposed. So we did that and that took some days. But you know what? We already knew we had this thing working the way we wanted. So all we had to do was run the test again and it works. We actually have JMX parity um, coming in React 1.4. So what I learned from this, you know, I learned this tried and true lesson that I learned throughout my career, which is uh, test-driven development is like going to the gym. You know, it's, uh, it's good for me, and I feel better when I do it, but if you forget to go like one day, then it's like harder to go the next day, and then you like by a week, you know, you just don't go anymore, and you were that guy who used to go to the gym. 
Um, but it, it's, it's worthful. Um, I also learned the React test is better at CI than it is at test driven development. It is, um, you know, there's a lot of waiting around for React tests. You've got to make the dev rel every time you make a change to React. You've got to copy the thing into the Git repository. You've got to rebuild the test. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it has a workflow that kind of slows, slows you down sometimes. And it, if I get the time, I'd like to add a, uh, like a test driven, more rapid iteration by mode, I guess. It would have been hard to manually test that process killing stuff, especially the process killing stuff that, um, that I was trying to do with the PS, you know, AX. Like once I started on port 80, that thing became like trivially easy, but I didn't expect that to be the way I was gonna go. And you know, when you're trying to like, trying to kill a process 10 times in 10 seconds, that's not something that like a, a person can actually do. So you can find out more at, um, let's see, so this, uh, GitHub URL is where all the code slides are for this talk. Um, if you actually, if you, um, yeah, I'll give you the slides later. The repositories here, including the JMX test, all of our, um, all of our React EE tests are actually open source in React test as well. So you can see how we test that. Um, and that's really it. I can take some questions and I can go on to some, also some greatest hits of React test if, um, if you want. All right, um, let's see, so what do I got here? I got, um, you know, give me a green folks, I'm awesome, and you guys are awesome too, I, I love having you here. Um, but we can talk about React's greatest, React test greatest hits if you want. Um, do you want to? You want to hear a little bit more about like some like fun sort of like functions that I can do? Um, you can leave if you don't, it's fine, um, but you know, vote green when you do. Uh, <laughs> so this RT console t uh, function is how we test a um, console interaction in React. You guys may or may not know, but you can, um, you can start, uh, you can attach to a running React node with a React attach call, and, or you can start a React node at the Erl in the Erlang console and basically say, okay, now I've got this node running and I've got an Erlang interpreter exposed to it. Um, so how do you test that that works? We created this cool thing that actually goes through this list of, of, um, of tuples here, and the first uh, element in the tuple is either expect or send, um, and so you either expect to get this output back on the, back on the port, or you, expect, or you send this output and then wait around for this response, or a response containing this thing. So this thing is easy, right? We're just attaching a React console. We expect that you know, classic abort with control G message. Um, if we get that, then we send this React core ring manager get my ring. We expect it to return some kind of dict. Again, we don't know what, kind, what the exact values of it are, but we know it should be a dict. Um, and then we send the, you know, the queue uh, function, and then we expect it to say okay. And then, uh, so we basically we just told it to quit, so then we hang around here and wait until the node's unpingable. If it stays pingable for five minutes, which is the timeout value on this thing, then it's like, hey, um, you know, you told this thing to shut down and it totally didn't, so I'm gonna fail your test now, throw an assertion. This thing is chock full of assertions in there. Um, uh, Russell Brown did this cool thing, which is the, uh, the React uh, CRDT counter convergence test. And what's really cool about this is um, this, our, this partition stuff. So up here in part, part info, what he did was, he said, you've got this four node cluster, you know, N1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, partition the cluster in, um, you know, so that 1 and 2 can still communicate and 3 and 4 still can still communicate. And we do that by basically taking the second pair and reversing the cookie on it and then doing like a RPC to like or like disconnect. And so now these guys like aren't aware of each other, but the React test node, which is another one in this whole family, like still knows about both of them. So he can be like, hey, you know, what's, uh, what's going on over there? And then we can try and do some operations. And then uh, basically down here, we can heal the cluster and then make sure those op the, uh, the data type counter actually converged. Um, so that's uh, this, um, this ability to test uh, partition behavior is pretty cool. And then, uh, let's see, the last one is, is my favorite. This is loaded upgrade. This is um, a test that we actually check to see that some, there's some function that, some functionality actually is maintained under load. And we upgrade an entire four node cluster from the previous version of React to the current version that we're testing. Um, we do all sorts of React operations on it while we do. And that thing basically spins up this supervisor that, um, that says, you know what, just um, 
This is the test that loops through it. So what it does is it, um, this RT upgrade node actually will take a node variable and upgrade it to the current version. So it could be any other version. Um, and then we start this worker, which basically says, do all these things. And it has to know what backend we're testing because it does different things based on different backends and features they support. Um, then we check to make sure the thing is upgrading. Then we start this loop, which basically just listens for errors from the upgrade threads. And they'll say like, oh, you know, I looked up a 2i query and it was totally wrong. And then we'll get an assertion and we'll fail it out here. Um, and then that's just the list comprehension over the nodes that, um, that are running. So this thing basically just loops through every node, upgrades, you know, wait, you know, just spends five minutes pounding on it, then upgrades the next node and does a rolling upgrade. Um, which is a really, really fun test to write. And what that looks like in, you know, like architecture speak is this thing where it's just, you have React test and it spawns these four nodes and then it spawns these worker threads, you know, 10 per node. So we're talking about like running 40 threads and each 40 threads spawns one of these test threads to, to hit these features. So you've got 40 threads, each spawning a thread to do KV, list keys, search, map reduce, and 2i against each node in the cluster. And any one of them that fails functionally during this like half hour, 35 minute test is going to kill the whole thing. And uh, this thing passes quite a bit actually, if you'd be surprised. Actually, it shouldn't be, it's awesome. Um, so that's it. Those are sort of my, my favorite like snippets of React tests that weren't really relevant to the uh, test-driven path that I did, but I thought I'd share them anyway. Um, so that, that's it. Um, come find me if you want to talk more about it. <laughs>